the crisis in the Ukraine on the so-called Middle East. My name is uh, Arshin Adib Mokadam. I'm a professor in global thought and comparative philosophies at the Department of Politics and International Studies at SOAS, University of London, which is hosting, co-hosting this event together with the SOAS Middle East Institute. It really gives me great pleasure to introduce two authorities on the international relations of the region and the wider, indeed, uh, world politics that is enveloping the crisis in the Ukraine and this crucial region of the world, West Asia, North Africa, usually referred to as the Middle East. Our first uh, distinguished speaker is Professor Hizai Nakanishi. Now, Hizai is a great friend and colleague who is currently a visiting professor at the Department of Politics at SOAS. She is a superstar of Middle Eastern studies uh, in Japan. Everyone talking about the region knows her in the country and beyond. And her former title is Professor of International Relations of the Middle East at the Graduate School of Global Studies, Doshisha University in Kyoto, beautiful Kyoto in Japan. Our interlocutor and second speaker is Dr. Karabekir Akoyunlu, who is a very dear colleague at the Department of Politics here at SOAS, a lecturer in the politics of the Middle East, published widely on the region, on Turkey, but also on a, a second crucial region of the world, and that is Latin America. So he has really a wide spectrum of knowledge of the international system. He has a forthcoming book, The Guardianship and Democracy in Iran and Turkey, so a comparative study, which is forthcoming with Edinburgh University Press. So what we will do is we will have Professor Nakanishi start off around 17, 18 minutes. Um, Dr. Akoyunlu will uh, respond and will give his comments. And then we should have plenty of time for uh, question and answer. And um, I'm really looking forward to, to what my two uh, dear colleagues have to say. So without further ado, um, Professor Nakanishi, please um, start us off. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, Professor Adim Mogaddam for kind introduction. And it is my great honor and pleasure to talk today. And my special thanks to uh, SOAS, um, particularly the Middle East uh, Institute. Um, also, I'm so grateful for accepting to be um, having a partner with for dialogue, uh, Professor Akuyundu. Um, I'm very glad to have a conversation with you after my brief talk. And let me share the screen. It's me. Um, I don't know what happened to my PowerPoint slides actually. So I think, <laughs> Uh, let me give me a few seconds and then I will um, get my PowerPoint back and then I think. Um, no problem. Um, yes. I, thank yes. you. I just wanted to say that you, know, you can address your questions in the chat um, uh, at any time and you know, I will then go through them and um, you know, ask our, our two distinguished colleagues to, to comment. Um, and I should have actually also thanked uh, Aki Alborzi, who's uh, our man at, at the SOAS Middle East Institute, who's, who's you know, okay. been behind organizing everything. Ready? Is that it? Yes. And, yeah? uh, okay, go ahead. Okay. And then um, since um, I don't know what happened to my screen, but uh, this always happens uh, when we rely on technology. But if I can get the zoom on uh, my uh, maps and such, probably I can show it later. But anyway, and um, uh, first of all, I'd like to start talking about the concept of the Middle East. And I was very inspired by uh, Professor Adib Mogadam's um, lecture delivered at Doshi University in December, 2018. And in his talk, he talked about the concept reflects uh, Eurocentric 
and the imperialistic legacy. And I'm using this concept still as a talk, as the title of my talk. However, that the, this is only to challenge it. And um, the magnitude of the conflict and the um, Ukraine crisis uh, covered in the media really indicated uh, how much uh, the impact is quite immense. But on the other hand, I found out uh, analysis on the Middle East and or I should say, actually West Asia or Greater Middle East uh, has not been enough. So in order to fill the gap in the scholarship, I just have to talk about the impacts. And then I found out there are four impacts. The first one is impact on uh, Syria. And the second day, impact on northern Iraq. Thirdly, impact on Nagorno-Karabakh in Azerbaijan. And then the last one is uh, actually uh, not exactly the impact, but uh, that is uh, indirect um, repercussion of the existing ongoing phenomena of the three country I'm going to talk about today. That is, um, possibility of um, uh, prevalence of cyber operations in the region. So I consider to use Eurasia is more appropriate uh, for my talk today. And um, I consider there are three key players after the crisis, Turkey, Iran, and Israel. Regarding um, the political dynamics and the power balance in the great Middle East, it is, it is to be seen that the Palestine question has been neglected by Arab states, particularly after 2018 Abraham Accord. But on the other hand, after the crisis started, intensification of Palestine um, conflict uh, came back quite intensively, but no one really pay attention to it. That is also a problem. But then while we are focusing on energy security, food security for Europe and the rest of the world, um, conflicts are intensifying first in Syria. United States and Russia got both involved in Syria at the same time. United States let Russia play a crucial role for the Assad government to come back to maintain in territorial integrity. But the Ukraine crisis started and we don't know when to end. So Russia is preoccupied with Ukraine and the conflict started um, between um, Iran and the Turkey and Israel. The one of the phenomena can be seen in the sense that um, Erdogan started to intensify its battlefields, uh, even went beyond the safe zone of Northeast Syria. And it's called the safe zone, but actually it's not safe. It's dangerous, so we should change the name, I suppose. But anyway, and then since the military operation in northern Iraq um, became severe, that really um, intensify its confrontation with Iran because Iran is also interested in uh, as a quite important key player after Russia almost ending or leaving the region. I will elaborate more if there's any more question about this. And the second aspect of the impact is um, we can see in Iraq. In the case of Iraq, um, Northern Iraq in particular is an um, area of autonomous region at some point, but uh, at the same time, uh, Turkey has ambition to expand its um, battle against um, PKK. And this also um, pressured Iran um, 
because Iran had the, wanted to secure its passage to and Lebanon and then also uh, Syria. So I think some passage is blocked. So um, tension is seen um, in northern Iraq. And we can see a series of um, uh, attacks happening uh, from Iranian side to um, attempting to targeting some Turkish bases in northern Iraq. So that is uh, quite a big uh, one of the impact. And the thirdly is uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. Since we pay much attention to um, the conflict in the Great Middle East, and the Syria, Palestine, and the Northern Iraq, uh, we tend to forget about uh, the crisis impact on the Central Asia and the Caucasus. As um, Nagorno-Karabakh um, was waged in the fall 2020, and that was quite a significant event in the region. And due to Turkish drone, which was quite effective, and then Israel's assistance, military assistance to Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan was able to restore, or I should say, and then captured quite a big region. And according to the peace agreement, the so-called Latin uh, corridor is um, kept by and maintained by Russian peacekeeping force. And if Latin um, corridor will be um, quite well functioned in the future, and that will impact much on the trade and the economic goods are going to develop much, much more in the future. So that would impact on existing trade routes of Iran. It may bypass existence, ex ex existing um, corridor um, from Azerbaijan, Iran um, to Turkey. So that is uh, another aspect of um, uh, conflict, which is um, change, changes the map of Central Asia and the Caucasus. And also Turkish, not only Turkish um, drones being effective in Azerbaijan, um, but also Israel's military presence also uh, provided much tension to Iran. Because um, already Azerbaijan and Iran relationship is very, very sensitive. And then Turkish, not only Turkish, Israel's presence on the border with Iran um, is naturally con considered a quite a big threat. So in the short term, um, some intens inter intensification of a conflict may happen more and more. But on the other hand, I don't think it will be quite a big total kind of war. It's a low intensity in nature. And after Russia and the United States more than less uh, left uh, or leaving the region, more regional players uh, compete each other for seeking much larger influence in the region. There are Israel, Turkey, and Iran. And lastly, I'd like to touch upon the cyber operation aspect of the region. Um, as everyone knows, um, JCPOA almost died, and the um, United States is video direct to resume and um, JCPOA back. But on the other hand, um, Iran's enlistment program progressed much high, and um, there is no carrot for Iran to jump on under these circumstances. So we cannot expect much about the lifting sanction against Iran sometime so near future. So sanction regime actually impacted on Iran's economy. 
And also it impacted on Iran's increasing uh, conventional military power. So um, cyber capability is a quite a big option, not only for Turkey and Israel, but also Iran, um, because it's not so expensive as buying fighter jets and um, conventional weapons. And also Iran is quite good at um, already uh, cyber, um, in the cyber technological advancement. So it is likely that um, one thing in common among these three key players is uh, cyber capability at present, and then that will be grow in the future. I'd like to provide just a short um, statement about the midterm prospect for Eurasia. As I mentioned already, um, spiral over effect of the crisis um, went beyond uh, conventional concept of Middle East. It went to uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, which is Eurasia. So we have to think about what's going to happen regionally. Is the regional integration will um, progress in the future? And I suppose so. Because the economy matters much, much more than politics on the ground. And this is more and more so um, under energy food crisis, as well as um, uh, securitized uh, phenomena of human security and the statecraft and the economic security. So economic security is a far more important uh, for the majority of the nation right now. So uh, conflict and the competition of power are actually, um, you know, both sides of the coin, I suppose. So I'm saying in the short term, conflict will continue in a different format, low intensity, but at the same time, there is also um, a trend for um, in, in integration regionally at large, because um, as I mentioned, cyber capability will increase um, in this region. And then um, if let's say five years later, 10 years later, if po foreign policy making can be done by the power of AI, and we will ask what is the best solution for the conflict resolution, and the AI may say, oh, well, you just have to cooperate. So um, probably um, very different future will come, I suppose, in the future. So I stop here because I'd like to have more dialogue and a conversation with um, Professor Kyunlu and also other audience. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Zai. Um, I will try to summarize things a little bit so that we can move on with a kind of understanding. Uh, I believe what, what you were trying to indicate in your very illuminating talk is that, you know, things are more interdependent not only because of forms of security interdependence, what is happening in Azerbaijan has an effect on Turkey, what is happening on, in Turkey has an effect on Israel, Iran, not only because of the radiating regional power of these three actors, but also because of an increasingly um, interdependent and integrated cyber world which makes access that much more possible, not only in terms of our Alexas and series, but also, for instance, destructively so um, with drone warfare, right? Um, so I think this is a crucial point uh, and, and, you know, really important for a future understanding of how peace and security can be achieved in a region that already has a long durée of um, interaction and, you know, interdependence that is cultural and ethnic and, and otherwise. So this is really crucial. Thank you so much. Um, Kara, please, um, you know, take it away. 
Okay, thank you very much, um, uh, Arshin, and thank you very much, Professor Nakanishi, for this um, uh, expansive um, uh, um, expose of um, the various sort of regional local dynamics and how they're moving forward or changing with uh, the crisis uh, next door. And I think, you know, I, I can only agree with uh, your, um, you know, um, opening framework of uh, you know, questioning the concept of the Middle East um, as an internally homogenous um, region that is essentially different and delineated and separated from its, its surroundings. And this is, you know, problematic to begin with. We know this already, but I think the war in Ukraine is uh, just making that uh, more obvious. Um, the, the, the impact, the reactions within the region, the dynamics for different countries are various, they're diverse. But more than that, as both of you have pointed out, there is so much more interdependence uh, that cannot be uh, just you know, uh, analyzed within the confines of uh, what we call MENA or the Middle East. Uh, so I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with this sort of pushback against what we might call uh, methodological regionalism, um, you know, and, and of course the sort of um, not forgetting the, uh, the colonial orientalist underpinnings of the, of the concept of the Middle East. So we are in a much more transnational, transregional, interdependent uh, era, uh, militarily, economically, uh, technologically as well. Um, I guess what I would, I'm, I'm going to try to do is um, take away a few points, both from uh, your, um, uh, your presentation and also uh, from what I have been you know, observing and thinking with regards to the impact of uh, the, the, the war in Ukraine on this region. And, uh, and I, I think, and what I'm going to do is uh, both try to unpack some of what you've already talked about and maybe um, sort of uh, push for, for us to discuss a little bit more some of the points that maybe we haven't mentioned uh, yet. So if, you know, when I think about the, the impact of uh, the, the war in Ukraine on the, the Middle East, um, I think about three main categories um, so, or, or three analytical sort of uh, frameworks. One is the, the area of energy and food security. Um, and, and that also shows us the sort of interdependence uh, the global interdependence uh, that cannot be uh, uh, ignored because it has a dramatic impact on the ground for millions of people. So perhaps we could talk a little bit more about the societal impact on, um, of the crisis in Ukraine, a very sort of imminent, urgent societal impact, and especially with regards to food security. I mean, energy is another complicated issue, but it, especially food security is something that is being felt very uh, uh, directly on the streets. And we're talking about countries like Yemen, Egypt, um, Lebanon, Tunisia that I can just think about uh, being very much dependent on wheat imports from Russia and Ukraine. And these countries are already uh, you know, in economic dire straits. Um, there's a very uh, fragile social political um, uh, scenario on the ground. And we know the and you know, socioeconomic as well with rising inflation, economic crisis. And we know the symbolic importance of bread as a source of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, protest and unrest um, and, and demand for change in this region. So, you know, add to that environmental impact, worsening droughts. Um, I would like to ask if you think we're on the possibly cusp of another wave of discontent uh, that pours out and, and what would that look like, um, especially in, you know, we're not uh, 10 years on from uh, the Arab uprisings with completely new technological uh, instruments also in the hands of the governments as well. Um, so what is that sort of, uh, how do you see that in the perhaps uh, short to medium run? Um, that would be the first sort of uh, analytical framework. The second um, category uh, relating to the, um, uh, impact of the, the war on uh, the region is the question of on a more sort of uh, state level um, taking sides right uh, there's this conversation about a new cold war emerging um, you know who's on the side of the west who's on the side of Russia the Biden administration tried to sort of uh, put the narrative of democracy versus uh, authoritarian regimes so freedom versus tyranny again 
but it doesn't seem to have uh, worked in a sense. If you look at it, many of the countries on the region, in the region, uh, prefer to sit on the fence as much as possible. Um, and, you know, there are some that are more clearly, you know, supporting the territorial integrity of Ukraine. Others are more ambivalent. But we haven't seen a type of polarization that would sort of give us a sense of a Cold War redux. And that my reading of it is that this just shows not only the, you know, the waning influence of Russia, you know, Russia hasn't, has, has had limited capacity, but this has become much more exposed, I think, with the war in Ukraine, but also the waning influence of, of the West. So I, I think, you know, uh, connecting with uh, your presentation, uh, Professor Nakanishi, um, we have this phenomenon of both um, the US and, and Russia sort of withdrawing from the region or being distracted. So, and, and that opens up a lot of uh, possibilities of, uh, you know, new dynamics, uh, perhaps more local dynamics taking um, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, prevalence. Um, so you talked about whether this would lead to some type of regional integration and normalization in the long run with also this sort of paradoxical relationship of conflict and cooperation, um, you know, together. I question maybe from a, a bit more cynical perspective, but also looking spe more um, specifically from the Turkish angle, whether we are actually seeing you know, po this possibility or new potential for normalization and regional integration, uh, or what we're seeing is you know, a, a bunch of pragmatic alliance shifts um, you know, on the base of short-term geopolitical interest. In other words, is there a long-term convergence in the horizon of values, of interests and identities. Maybe, you know, if we think about the a new relationship between the Gulf monarchies and Israel, there is something that could be said, you know, that's something that's going to stay for the long run, I think so. But I think overall, the sort of short-termism and pragmatic alliance making and shifting still prevails at the moment in the region. So, uh, if we have time, what I would like to explore a little bit more, because you've mentioned three countries, Turkey, Iran, and Israel, I'd like to perhaps explore a little bit more um, uh, the, what you make of the position of uh, the, um, the Arab countries, especially Gulf monarchies in, 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 in this entire saga. Um, you know, um, they are traditionally the more pro-Western, pro-US uh, states. However, um, they have with the exception of Qatar, which is interesting because it was considered to be the more closest to, to Iran, right? Uh, Qatar has come out quite actually forcefully in, in, in support of Ukraine, but UAE and, and Saudi Arabia have been very much sitting on the fence. What is the sort of, you know, um, logic there? Um, so perhaps that's something we could um, explore a little bit further. And the last point um, I'd like to get into is actually what you, uh, you know, talked about the most, and that's uh, the geopolitical vacuum uh, from, uh, you know, uh, Russia getting stuck increasingly in Ukraine and, 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 the, and, and the impact of that uh, uh, sort of lessened Russian influence would have on existing tensions and conflicts. You've uh, elaborated on, you know, Syria, Northern Iraq, and, and Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, my two cents on this would be especially with regards to Iran and Turkey. I, I think I see that both countries in different ways um, have been trying to use Russia as a leverage against the West. Uh, they have not had uh, uh, ever imagined replacing the West with Russia. Uh, so in that sense, it's important that they, 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 Russia is not completely out of the picture so they can maintain this balancing act. And you can see um, you know, in both governments uh, re re reaction that they want uh, that sort of equilibrium somehow uh, to prevail. Um, a few words about Turkey on this, um, because I think it has really sort of, um, uh, Ad the Erdogan government has really uh, tried to uh, reap as much benefit from the crisis as possible. Uh, before the, the, the invasion started, um, many of us thought that Turkey's sort of balancing act between NATO and Moscow would be untenable because you know, the situation would be so polarized and polarizing, Turkey would have to choose a side. But that didn't happen, interestingly, um, partly because of uh, the Russian debacle, 
uh, that show limitations of Russian capacity. But Turkey has maintained this balancing act uh, fairly successfully so, so far. And, and interestingly, um, Erdogan uh, uh, benefited from the fact that Putin is now the number one enemy in the West. And, and he is much more sort of, you know, uh, tolerable in the eyes of his Western counterparts and more sort of strategically important. Um, and, and, you know, so he has become strategically and Turkey has become strategically more important both for Moscow, for Putin, for Kiev and, and NATO. And Erdogan is trying to reap the benefit of this, of this strategic importance as much as possible, sometimes even pushing his hand, uh, 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 you know, uh, I think uh, too, too much. But interestingly, you know, bringing the topic to um, your emphasis on the drones and cyber warfare, um, Turkey has emerged in this period as a, you know, um, as a fairly uh, aggressive, I would say, with a fairly aggressive nationalist militarism, which actually is also a result of the internal uh, social political coalition in, in Turkey, that is relying more and more on hard power tools rather than soft power tools as it did about a decade ago. Um, and, 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 you know, uh, uh, it's putting this to use in various conflicts, right? Libya, Nagorno-Karabakh, um, in Syria and, and, and Iraq against the Kurds. Uh, but the Western um, narrative on, on, this, on this Turkish resurgence, um, it, it's very interesting to follow because since the beginning of the Ukrainian war, it has somewhat shifted. So let me give you just one quick example. Uh, during the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, uh, the, I mean, um, the, uh, yeah, in, in, um, um, the German tabloid Bild, which is not representative of you know, perhaps Ge European, uh, uh, you know, uh, viewpoints, but this one good example, um, you know, had a feature about the Turkish drones, which, and the title was uh, Turkey's killer drones, okay? Recently, they had another feature about the drones, which, by the way, is getting a lot of attention in, in the West, you know, the, how the Turkish drones have revolutionized warfare, etc. And in this new feature, in the framework of the Ukrainian crisis and the use of the Turkish drones against Russian military, they called the same uh, drones, which were killer drones, this time they called them weapons of hope. So from killer drones to weapons of hope, you see this narrative shifting and, and, um, and Erdogan is using this sort of space uh, to expand as much as possible uh, his influence and also you know, make up for a lot of insecurities back home. So we have an imminent operation, military operation, uh, in uh, Tajrifat and Mambij. Um, and, and I think this is, you know, the, you know, one of the resurgence, sort of one of the countries that will try to reap as much benefit as possible from the conflict will be Turkey. Anyway, um, that's, um, I, I should probably stop there. Um, we um, would, I'd love to hear more for, uh, on this from you and from our audience. Thank you, Arshin, as well. Thank you, Professor Makanish. Uh, excellent, Kara. Uh, this gave us exactly the complementary insight uh, that, that we needed and opened it up more specifically to uh, the direct impacts of the Ukraine crisis on, on the region. And um, indeed, uh, you know, a, a fantastic also insight into the dynamics in Turkey and, and beyond. Um, Hizai, I would like to um, invite you to, to respond, and we already have questions in the chat. Um, so, you know, by all means, um, respond, and then we can move on uh, to a dialogue um, with, the, with the audience. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for uh, a lot of insightful um, comments, and also, um, you know, Broad perspective, but also quite um, you know diverse um, issues involved in the topic we are covering today. And as far as I counted, you made six points and asked me six questions, but I don't think I have time to answer them all. Please so don't I, feel obliged. Yes. I will, <laughs> but I like challenge always, so I try to do my best to answer as much as um, possible within the time constraint. So first of all, regarding food security, and it's already so visible, and then Lebanon and in Egypt uh, quite uh, seriously affected. And um, I think a food poverty uh, rate increased dramatically. So I think that will um, impact on the governance issue of both states. 
And then um, already the uh, situation in Lebanon is already fragile, but uh, this crisis, food insecurity crisis may uh, illegitimize the current government. And then so there is a possibility that the Lebanon's um, government will be uh, getting more more challenged by the people. So it's a question of legitimacy and how much governance can really manage this crisis is uh, quite a big issue. And you mentioned Yemen. So, you know, Yemen is a forgotten conflict and the peace agreement was made, but I don't think it's really implemented. So, and then of course, Yemen has been heavily depend on uh, Ukraine's grain. So I'm very sure tragedy is occurring in Yemen, even though it's not covered in the media. So we shouldn't forget such a uh, you know, forgotten uh, conflicts in the region. And the regarding, um, let's see, the Lord of Turkey. And um, when I looked into the reports published by IISS about the um, cyber capability and the national power published the last year, they examined the 15 states and then they categorize the first year, second year, third year. And the first year is, of course, the United States. And the second year, there are five states mentioned in which Israel and Iran are mentioned. And then Turkey is not even mentioned because it's not even covered in the report. It's not counted among uh, the significant states of 15 countries they analyze. So this really indicates how much Western world did not understand the magnitude of a Turkish power. And then even though Nagorno-Karabakh conflict demonstrated Turkish and drone powers, but they didn't even think about real um, cyber capability. And the Western narrative is always um, from with security kind of um, needs of the West. They do not address needs of the region. So uh, you talked about, um, you know, Cold War style of um, demarcation of the world. It is almost like revival of September, I mean, 11. You are with us or you are with, not with us. But um, from the beginning of the conflict, I was always questioning why the EU, EU is emphasized too much about that uh, we are fighting against um, you know, Russia because of the sake of the democracy, but uh, how much we can really consider the Ukraine even in the pre-war period as a democratic state. But saying this, I'm not really saying democracy should be always implemented in all over the world. And um, I think there is some needs of um, being authoritarian and uh, in order to fulfill national security of its needs. So I think that this kind of uh, state security uh, needs seems to be quite more vital after the crisis it became more clear. So how to strike a balance between uh, strengthening or maintaining alliance and uh, fulfilling state security is a quite a big question for many countries in Eurasia. Saying this, I think each state has a lot of strategy developing to cope with the new reality of almost incompatibility of the alliance and the state security, but you really have to uh, more or less um, have an approach to make it compatible. So um, regarding the question of um, how much um, you know region is going to be integrated or still some 
um, pragmatic alliance would result in the conflict for some times. I think it's both. And the small conflicts always um, happening, are happening and also will continue. But at the same time, and then, um, for example, we really need a lot of um, high technology and we need soft power capability. So why, for example, United States uh, was willing to sell um, the fighter jet to Turkey, but the Turkey went to Russia and because we are paying much attention to conventional weapon. But what, how Gulf states developed its relationship with China did it shows and what the Gulf states wanted from China is not only selling oil, but also highly uh, technological equipment and uh, even weapons from China to enhance both conventional and um, uh, cyber capability to enhance. So this is uh, quite a pragmatic attitude. But then in order to survive in the hybrid warfare and also in the age of um, interdependence, um, I think uh, each state has to be quite prag pragmatic because they have to share technology. So that uh, needs on the ground shape um, to what extent each state has to cooperate each other and at the same time um, they would confront each other. I'll give you one specific example. I think it's recently um, then Iran and Tajikistan um, get closer even though there was some tension and then uh, Iranian factory, drone factory was going to be built in Tajikistan quite soon. And then this is the first time um, such a factory will be built outside Iran. So this really, what this really means? And who is going to make use of Iranian drone produced in Tajikistan? It is likely um, China's technology may be involved and then Russia may use it. They can easily procure it. So then can we interpret this that Iran is leaning to Russia? I think that's too simplistic. So um, I think each state has to choose uh, foreign policy and also domestic security um, as a quite prioritized the goal to survive. And by so doing, um, they have to utilize the soft power and then also conventional kinetic power as well. But uh, eventually, I suppose, uh, cyber capability will have more upper hand. So that will make the region um, more or less more regionally integrated in the long run. That's my answer at this point. And I have more to talk about, but I think we have to open the floor for discussion. So I stop here. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, Isai. Uh, Kara, maybe the two or three minutes, um, you know, elaborating on what, on what was said here, um, and then um, we can open up for, for questions, should give us enough time um, for the questions. Um, yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Um, uh... Yeah, I think I think um, one of the things that maybe we can uh, sort of uh, you know take from uh, Professor Nakanish's um, response and, and uh, is um, and, and what we haven't really mentioned is also the sort of um, uh, the, the the way that you know uh, the West and especially the U.S. administration has tried to portray um, the. Um, uh, situation in Ukraine has fallen mainly on deaf ears, not only on the state level, but on the sort of popular level in many of the countries of the region as well. 
Um, so there we're not really talking so much about a sort of uh, you know, diplomatic foreign policy calculus, but rather um, a more emotive, um, a more honest perhaps um, a response. So, um, you know, it's not a matter of whether the, uh, Ukraine is a, a, a you know, democracy or not, which I think it's, it's more of a democracy for sure than, than Russia, but um, the, the sort of uh, the um, uh, urgency that uh, was uh, uh, that was seen in the West and uh, was expected by Western governments to also uh, be seen in, in, in other parts of the world and you know, the Middle East, it just didn't seem um, uh, genuine to uh, many people in the region who have seen, um, you know, illegal invasions and occupations and, and warfare and a complete disregard of human rights and, and international law over the last uh, decade or so, two decades, right? I mean, we're talking about the Iraq war, we're talking about um, Af Afghanistan, we're talking about Yemen, and, you know, um, US, UK weapons have been used extensively in the destruction of Yemen. We don't need only, you know, direct invasion. So I think this notion uh, uh, was met with skepticism at best uh, at, at a popular level uh, too. So I think in that, in that regard, um, you know, that's something that also needs to be taken into consideration when we're talking about the sort of regional reactions. And that has some sort of resonance probably with governmental sort of responses as well, although not entirely. I, I, I mean, I think I defer to you for, uh, uh, to, to analyze better the sort of the potential, uh, uh, the, the, the political uh, uh, and, 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 and diplomatic potential of cyber uh, uh, technologies. It's, I, I'll admit it's not uh, one of my areas of um, uh, expertise, although it, it needs to be, I guess, more and more for everyone because this is uh, not just the future, it's the, the present. Um, but uh, but I, I was interested when you first mentioned in, um, in, your, in your talk that um, you know, uh, there will be cooperation in the region once AI comes in and tells us it's better to cooperate. I mean, at, at, the, at the level, that's a very depressing analysis too, right? That, that just means that us humans won't be able to do it on our own and we need artificial intelligence to show us the way forward. Um, anyway, I mean, I think those are some of just uh, you know, uh, immediate reactions that I had um, um, uh, to uh, some of the points uh, that we discussed. There's obviously a lot more to say, but I think you know, we can probably open up the floor. Yeah, um, uh, excellent. I mean, the, the, the two interventions by you actually speak to the questions in, in, in the chat. Um, and it's quite interesting. I mean, if there is something like the SOAS school of Middle Eastern studies, right? Then it came out um, in the presentations and also in the nature of the, of the questions. Indeed, we do study uh, the impact of artificial intelligence on the region. It's part of our MSc in Middle East politics. Our postgraduate students have the options to, to study this. Um, and we also study, um, this came out uh, in, in, in the talk of uh, both Professor Nakanishi and Ako Yungu, that we do uh, need to also consider um, hypocrisy in European US foreign policy towards the region. Um, and not out of some kind of, you know, anti-Westernism. No, it's about, you know, learning from past mistakes and making sound and rational policies towards the region, which is better for everyone concerned, right? There is just too much bad analysis that yields bad policies, right? Um, so the two questions um, are, are interrelated um, and, and, and amazingly interesting. One from a dear colleague at the American University in Cairo, uh, Dr. Marwa Hamdu Salem. Um, and the question here is about authoritarian resilience, the Xeno-Russian model, and how far the war adds to this um, democratization crisis in West Asia and North Africa. Are people um, following, or are governments there following this this uh, you know model of authoritarian resilience now? And what is the kind of power resistance dynamics um, that you both talked talked about in a decade after the the Arab revolts? Uh, please, uh, Isai, and then Kara, and then the second question. Um, thereafter. So if you can keep it to kind of five minutes and then we have time for, for a, a second very pertinent question. Please, Isai. Okay, um, then regarding authoritarian re re resilience, and, um, much debate has um, happened already, let's say 15 years ago, and the rep representative um, case was uh, Iran and Syria. 
And the, the book published on, you know, how much authoritarian regime is so strong, that is a resilience issue. So when it comes to Russia, and what, what will be the impact of um, this crisis on Russia, there's a lot of debate in Europe and the rest of the world. And um, I think people talk about the sanction because of the, you know, international sanction, um, probably Russian economy will doomed. But if you just think about how much uh, Iran, excuse me, Russia gained out of the high peak of oil and natural gas price, um, I do not think um, sanction can really uh, curtail Russia's economy as much as uh, Western society, Western countries hope. So as long as um, you know Russian economy is concerned and um, oil and natural gas are quite important um, for Europe in particular and also some other part of the world like China too. So and India in particular, Russia will prevail as a quite important energy supplier, even if crisis is over at some point. The question is um, what kind of, um, you know, oligarchy will take over the power of Putin or Putin may remain in power. And even if Putin is uh, pushed aside after a lot of pressure, um, still, I think oligarchical um, governance will prevail most likely in Russia. Because in order to um, make um, quite effective judgment about how to sell natural resources, authoritarian regimes are more effective. I'm not really supporting authoritarian regime, but that's always the case. So I think and the reason why why United States has been um, aligned with Saudi Arabia and the UAE because they are authoritarian regimes in a way, so they can easily manipulate. So um, I don't think um, authoritarian resilience um, will be out of scope even after the Ukraine crisis. Rather, Russia remains as a quite a resilient power in Eurasia. That's my um, prospect. Thank you so much, Isai. Kara, what is happening in the region? Is, is authoritarian resilience the, the model that, that will be followed? Is there, is there any hope for societies to, to resist as they did a decade ago? Well, I think, um, you know, the, the, the literature on uh, politics and society in the Middle East has been, you know, mystified by this authoritarian resilience or democratic deficit question for way too long. And, um, you know, we the, the Arab uprisings gave a sort of, you know, change in narrative and certain hope, but then the return of, you know, renewed autocracies has sort of crushed that hope a little bit. So I think we need, we need to step a little bit back and, and not be presentist, you know, in our hopes and, and, and our despair. Um, uh, uh, there is still, uh, you know, as much a demand for uh, a dignified uh, 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 life, um, a, a sort of, you know, safe, secure, uh, and, and representation, you know, proper representation in the region. So, if, you know, if that's how we define democracy, the push or demand for democracy is as high as ever in the region. But the question is whether um, a, 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 a local, regional, and international dynamics. Um, allow uh, these uh, demands uh, to come to fruition or actually create layers of you know, obstacles. And I see in this juncture that there are more obstacles and constraints than, uh, than, than possibilities of uh, you know, going beyond uh, just frustration and into something uh, you know, positive, you know, turning, in, turning governance. Um, it was very quickly, specifically uh, looking at the question, the question asked uh, about uh, the uh, Sino-Russian model of authoritarian resilience, I would uh, dis distinguish between Russia and China. Um, I don't think Russia has neither uh, the economic uh, uh, or political cap capacity, nor uh, the sort of imaginative capacity to be a model, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, I, and I think the, the, it's sort of, uh, 
the exposure of its um, rotten core in the Ukrainian crisis, in this Ukrainian war, has actually made that uh, uh, you know, um, imagination even more uh, sort of uh, uh, far ahead. Russia uh, is not, I think, a model for the region. China, on the other hand, is another question. It's, it's much more potent. Um, it's much more quiet, and, and, but, but much more effective. Uh, I don't think we have time to discuss this. It's been the elephant in the room. And China has been relatively quiet and inward looking throughout this COVID period, but that's not going to last forever. Um, you know, once it sort of you know, comes out again, the, we're going to have to talk about the Chinese effect, both direct economic, political, but also as a model uh, on governance. Uh, we're going to have to talk about that more. Thank you very much, Howard. There is another question about um, the specter of, of the double standards, right? And here, in particular, in comparison uh, between uh, the Ukraine crisis and what, what happened in Yemen, and both of you talked about this. Um, it, it goes back to this um, issue of, of you know, bad policy and bad analysis yielding uh, hypocrisy and hypocrisy is a problem. Research has shown even in the implementation of foreign policies. Right, if you if your foreign policies do not seem legitimate, if they are revealed as hypocritical, then you have problems implementing them um, in a contested and, and in many ways power congested region such as West Asia and North Africa. So why is this? Is this hierarchies of power? Um, I mean, Palestinians of course have a lot to say about this as well with the current crisis. But Hizai and, and Kara, what, why is it so pronounced still that we have these um, double standards? Hizai, please. Um, well, I think it's so convenient and then also effective in the age of information. And then when I was analyzing um, then who is winning in the east part of Ukraine last three weeks and then what kind of information we are receiving from Western media, I've been watching um, you know, BBC, Euronews, Al Jazeera, TRT, uh, CNN, uh, NHK World News, you know, and then comparing what kind of information we're receiving. And then there's assumption what the Europe uh, say uh, is always true, while what the Russia says is fake. And then I, I witnessed this kind of um, you know, phenomena, particularly after the Ukraine crisis happened. Because um, you know, it, it's so anyway, when I Think about um, what Europe has been claiming about um, Ukrainians and uh, fighting back well effectively against Russia here and there. And then three, four days later, suddenly says, you know, actually, and the Russia incited the region much, and then there's no chance, but for, you know, Ukrainian forces can really fight anymore. So can you really believe like um, two months, Ukrainian is, uh, you know, gaining the ground and then three, four days later, suddenly, actually not. So I'm wondering, and um, who is uh, transmitting um, this information? But I think that this information, um, that's also my judgment, but um, who decided this is correct and incorrect? I think um, power did it determined that which discourse is stronger and then um, receive more validity or legitimacy on the ground. But the, because of a uh, uh, social media and um, media is so globalized and then um, you can get then a lot of information, but at the same time, there's a lot of manipulation of um, any stakeholder to serve its own needs. So I think uh, in, the, in the aid of ICT, um, I think double standards are easily, more easily transmitted than before, which is quite dangerous. Kara, please, uh, in, in one or two minutes, and that there, there is maybe you can address another question about 
uh, this return of nationalism. Um, my dear colleague, uh, Dr. Ali Alaviat Soas asked about this. Um, you know, there is a form of, you know, maybe psychonationalism, may call it, or nationalism, or hypernationalism in Russia. Is that also a re reoccurring in the, in the region? Mm -hmm. um, what do you think? Yes, I mean, very quickly, because of the lack of time, uh, I think nationalism is, um, has never gone away as we assumed it would. It's always been potent, but I think definitely it's resurgent. I mean, Turkey is going through a new wave of nationalism, for instance, um, from very different angles, you know, conservative to left to uh, Islamist to, you know, secular, but, um, and, and it's the, again, the force that drives politics, you know, on both sides of the, um, you know, political divide, nationalism is the main ideology, interestingly. Um, so, but I, I'll only say that on this. Um, with regards to the question of hypocrisy, very quickly again, first of all, you know, hypocrisy is not you know, a Western monopoly. Let's remember this again, looking at Russia, looking at Turkey, I think hypocrisy is very much there, but the, what makes the Western sort of hypocrisy so, uh, you know, interest or so you know, maybe unique is A, uh, because of the global power that especially the United States has, it's much more amplified. And secondly, it's shrouded in a rhetoric of uh, you know liberalism and liberal democratization, uh, and, and in a sense, um, you know uh, the West binds itself or puts itself in a bind by trying to use this normative uh, sort of framework of liberal democracy to while it's pursuing very you know I would perhaps realist geopolitical goals. I mean, in one way, you could say that you know so, you know perhaps. In Russia, there's also this rhetoric about, you know, Nazis, etc. In Ukraine, but there is a core realism that is quite stark, um, and that makes it look more honest, <laughs> you know, in a sense. But when you use this sort of normative sort of argument of democracy, human rights, but then you don't actually you, you use it selectively according to your own interests, and you violate it when when it fits your interests. Of course, uh, that. And, and there are a lot of people on the receiving end of this, that's going to create a huge amount of distrust and resentment across the world. I, so I think that's a huge disservice to the concepts of uh, democracy, of human rights, which I think are, are, are to be cherished. They're very, very important. And, and I think, you know, so yeah, anyways, I guess that's enough. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we, we ran out of time um, and we have to end it here. Thank you so much, Hizai Kara. Thank you to the audience. Uh, was really an, uh, an illuminating um, event. I learned a lot and at SOAS, we don't shy away from the big questions. That's what I take out of this. So thank you very much. And you will uh, have the opportunity to also share this event. It is live streamed on Facebook and it will be on our website very soon. Thank you very much, everyone from hot and steamy London. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.